Okay. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know we have many new participants here, and I'm really excited to have some new ones and many repeat. So um, just really glad to have you here. I want to go over just a couple of rules before we start, just um, so you understand the process. Um, you can participate at whatever level you feel comfortable. Those of you that feel comfortable, I would love for you to turn your cameras on. I love being able to see your faces. And if you don't feel comfortable with that, that's fine. You can leave your, your camera off. We, during the uh, webinar, at first, I'm gonna leave everyone's microphones muted and I will be talking with Sarah directly. You can use the chat room to, um, to put in questions that you have for me while I'm questioning Sarah. If you do have a question that you would like me to ask while I'm questioning Sarah, just put that in the chat room in all caps. And then I will know that that question is for me to ask Sarah. If you wanna communicate amongst yourselves, just do that in, um, in uh, small letters and then I'll know that that, that, that isn't for me. So now that we have the formalities over with, um, for those of you that don't know me, I am Kelly Marquis. I have been showing dogs since I was eight years old. And when I first started, I grew up with dogs. My mom had, I think at one time we had 25 dogs. And my happy place was being with my dogs, dressing them up, putting them in baby carriages and snowmobiling with them, uh, sledding with them. They, they did everything with me. So although I had friends, I really preferred the company of my dogs. And because I grew up with dogs, I really have an innate instinctive nature with them. I just really understand how they think, how they feel being with dogs comes very naturally to me. So oftentimes when things come up with dogs, I, I don't need to think, I just, I react and I know just what they need. That being said, I do come across many dogs that do challenge my innate abilities, where there is a behavior that I would like to see, or a maybe I want them to stand and stay, and they're very anxious, and that can um, involve me having to start problem solving. So in this webinar, one of the things I really want to talk about, we're going to be talking about managing difficult dogs and challenging situations. And what I believe is really necessary in being able to do that is to have a strong connection with your dog. And so you hear this word a lot, connection. And what does that word connection mean? One of the ways I'd like to describe it is if you picture two pieces of a puzzle, you have two independent pieces and then they snap together and they become one. That's something that I'm always striving for as a handler is how to get, get a connection with my dog where the two of us become so in tune with one another that we connect and we become one. Now my process and how I do that is probably unique to me in some ways, but there will be other people that will connect in a similar fashion. So one of the reasons why I like having different professionals come on meet the professionals is we all have our own unique way of doing things. So I can tell you how I work and Sarah may actually have a very different way of accomplishing a similar thing. So um, one, of the, one of the reasons for me bringing Sarah on is I've watched Sarah through the years work with very, very difficult dogs um, dogs that as someone else is trying to hold on to them, they're dragging them across the floor and they just cannot wait to get to Sarah. And, you know, this is a behavior that Sarah will be free to comment on it, but I would almost describe some of her dogs as neurotic. They're, they may be um, panting, jumping, pulling the owner or perhaps assistant that's trying to hold on, hold on to this dog. And when this dog gets into Sarah's hands, it's like the dog just takes a big deep breath and 
So there's something about Sarah that really helps these dogs. So I am really looking forward to having the opportunity to ask Sarah how she does what she does and to also um, allow you all as well to be able to ask, ask Sarah how she does what she does and even be able to ask Sarah if she has some possible solutions to problems some of you may be facing with your dogs as well. And then in addition, we also have the fact that this is Sarah is an AKC licensed judge of junior showmanship. And many of you are showing in juniors and this is a great opportunity to be able to ask a juniors judge one-on-one, -on -one, what are you looking for? So without further ado, I would like to say, welcome to Sarah. Welcome Hi, everyone. To Sarah. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming onto the webinar and volunteering your time for, for these juniors. And I really hope we have a lot of great information for them. Sure, lovely and glad to be here for you. <laughs> Thank you. So can you explain to me how you know what a dog needs? Um, you know, the, the honest and most straightforward answer is not really, um, because it's the dog that has to tell me. And in, in the years that I have been doing this, I have done everything. So I've had dogs reside with me for years um, through campaigning. I have had dogs come in and do pre-train so they'll stay a month or two and send them home. Um, I've had dogs come in, say, three or four weeks and head off to shows with me. Uh, over the last several years, I have more from so many varieties of the states that when they come in, they're usually coming in that night before the show or the morning of and stay with me for just that weekend. However, in my field of my comfort, I work best with what the client originally needs. And then I tell the client, your dog is going to tell us what it needs. So it may not be what works for your schedule, but if you want this job done, your dog is going to tell us how it needs to get done. And that's the direction we're going to follow. So going back to your question, when I deal with the dog, since I deal with so many varieties of temperaments and all different breeds and so forth, each one I deal with very specifically different. And it's the dog ultimately that will tell me how we need to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. That makes sense there. That makes great sense to me, but I would love if you could, um, I, I understand, I have a general concept, but if you could break it down more specifically, could you maybe break out a couple different examples of what a dog presented to, presented to you and how you came to understand what it was that that dog needed? Um, I think the first part would be to start off really early in my career when I started showing for other people. And I had had dogs my whole life. Of course, we all, most of us have had a dog, um, but I wasn't the caretakers of those dogs. And so when I had my own group of dogs, they were my first trainers and my very first bull mast. If she was rock solid, I could go anywhere in any ring and do anything with her and she was fine. And every now and then she'd give me a look and I would think, hmm, something's up, but I never really understood what she was trying to say. My next dog, before I started showing other people's dogs was a completely different temperament. And these are bull mastiffs, completely different temperament. She would look at me and I could tell she needed me. And I could tell that she wasn't going to be overly confident in the show ring. And I just had to walk her through the stages, but I could tell by looking at her, I could tell by watching her behavior. And the days that I saw her struggle, I would have to in tune to everything around me why she was struggling because I didn't see it of what she may have had an issue with. So, getting her through that, she was one of my biggest trainers because she was a softer bull mass if she was a mommy's girl. 
And after her, when I started moving out into other people's dogs and I started dealing with different breeds and I started realizing certain cues that they would do that if you, if you weren't really worried about the dog, you wouldn't have picked up on. And for me in the beginning, it was all about the dogs. It was all about caring for them, making it a happy experience. And how do I do that? So one of the dogs that I had dealt with very early on was a dog that wasn't used to being crated a lot. And he was a great show dog. He did everything I asked. He was one of those easy ones. And on the third day of showing at an indoor dog show that was very busy and he was crated quite a bit there because I had quite a few dogs. At the end of the day, he was looking at me and I was looking at him and he had something he'd never had before. And it was a glaze over the eyes. And I knew he was healthy. I knew he was fine. He wasn't sick, but something was happening and I didn't know what. And I took him out and I took him for a really long walk. And I found an area where I could throw some balls for him. And probably about 20 minutes later, I came back and I put him back in the crate and the glaze was gone. And I realized at that moment, he didn't want a handler, he needed a friend and he needed somebody to kind of release his tension. And he was one of my biggest training tools where I learned how much those eyes meant. And then I thought back to my dogs where all the things that they were telling me, I, I just, I didn't pay attention to and maybe it was something because I was so desperate to win and I wanted to win that I wasn't paying attention to what the dog was asking. So in early on, I started realizing how much the dogs tell you by how they look at you, how they react to you. Um, and the goal for me always from that moment forward was, you know what? I know these dogs have mommyitis, but I'm gonna replace mom. And I'm going to be better than mom. So that's the behavior I wanted. I wanted dogs pulling owners to me. I wanted the dogs so connected with me that, um, that they never looked back at the owners. And for the most part, that was the, the attitude I took from there on forward was to always make sure that I could read the dog, figure out what the dog needed and become the most important thing in that dog's life over the owners. And from there on forward, that was my job and that's what I had to do. So in, in summary of all the dogs since him and my own, that's all I have ever learned how to do was to make sure. And if I couldn't figure it out in the two minutes I had, if it was a dog that wasn't staying with me, I knew I could also figure it out in the two minutes that I had in the ring and be able to actually see the dog's behavior, how they were responding to the stress, how they were responding to the dogs being taken away from the owner. And I individually um, made packages for each of those dogs. In other words, the, the best um, for whatever the accomplishments that we wanted to achieve, I literally built the program for each one. And over the years, that was a lot of dogs, but I've learned they'll tell you what they need and you have to learn how to listen. You have to find a way to be the one that can communicate with them. I really love what you're saying. Um, it's, it's so important to be able to meet, to make sure that a dog's basic needs are met before you try to train them. So for instance, where you were able to see with the dog with the eyes that were glazed over, you know, that dog was stressed and it would have been um, to, to attempt to train a dog like that, that isn't feeling safe or yes. relaxed. It's mm -hmm. you're just not setting yourself up for success. So absolutely being able to look at a dog like you did and to be able to first start off are all their basic needs being met. You know, it has, does this dog feel safe? Um, for instance, you know, if a dog has just walked into a building and the dog is looking very, you know, nervous and agitated before you start training, you know, maybe what this dog needs is 
a walk around the building. So mm -hmm. I think that that's just a great thing that you bring everyone's attention to is before you ever train a dog to, to observe the dog, what is its body language telling you? And then once it's the, based on the cues that you get from their body language, when they start to relax and then appear more receptive, now you're ready to, to do some training. Right. There's over the years of, of being a dog trainer and doing it both in teaching classes, teaching handling classes, um, showing dogs, you're going to get nowhere with a dog that is completely stressed out. And unfortunately, our um, novice reactions are generally never in the benefit of a dog that is stressing out because you can't imprint, you can't imprint any positive behaviors on a dog that's stressing because that's the first and foremost right here that they have to deal with. So you have to be the person and a good handler will pick up on that and will know that dog isn't handling this. How do I get them through it? And I'm not going to get them through it by over aggressively trying to handle them, correcting them. Um, I'm only going to sink in the current fear that they may be feeling or the current stress that they're feeling and dogs will generalize that environment to it and it, you will work twice as hard to overcome it. Um, sometimes reward takes time and some dogs just need more time than others. And some walk in there and go, well, who, this is what the world is all about. This is what I love to do. And one, two, three could do and they're great. And then the others just need you. So another key point that you made that I really like is looking into a dog's eyes. You know, you look at their eyes and you, you try to get a sense of their well-being and what's going on for them. I see many handlers at shows that just, you know, grab a dog and they mm -hmm. immediately try to um, make it do what they want. And I have found in my experience, um, I'll often, you know, I really, I'll always ask, what is your dog's name? And I really try to take those moments to stop and really look in a dog's eyes. And sometimes that in and of itself, I've found, I don't know if this has been your experience, but can really settle a dog in. They feel seen and they can just settle. Mm -hmm. that, has that been part of your experience? Uh, definitely. Um, jokingly, I have very intense eyes and I often call them the, you know, good old resting bee face. And when I look at a dog, sometimes that intensity is so strong, I can actually get the dog to um, be fearful of me. And so I have to make up for that. And I have to find a way to give them calming signals in return so that if I'm looking to read their eyes, I have to turn my head a certain way so I'm not intimidating them such as breeds like Rottweilers and so forth that that look sometimes can be a little tough and um, I find that I agree with you a hundred percent the first thing first thing I do is ask the name and when we are in the moments like we're helping each other and I run up to help and I and I don't know the dog I don't know the dog's name and I'll ask right away what is the name and if somebody doesn't know, or if it went in one ear and out the other because my head was somewhere else, the first thing I revert back to is what I know they'll know, puppy. And I just start saying, hey, puppers. And the whole attitude starts to change. But I also know they don't know me. They haven't learned to trust me yet. So if I walked in there and tried to manhandle the situation on a dog that is not used to being transferred from one person to the next, I could make a real mess. And, and it could be um, a very negative experience for the dog. And so the first thing I will start doing is looking at the eyes, watching their body language, how they're handling me looking at them. If they're not too happy about it, but I know I can get, get away with it, I'll keep looking away <laughs> and get them through. Um, but if it's a client of mine or a dog that I know I'm starting a career with, I work extra hard to understand those eyes um, because they tell me a lot. It, it could be, it could be anything. I've had a dog look at me when somebody has come up to my grooming table and the look on their face just told me this wasn't a good, good visit. And I would step in front of it and be, you know, a little inquisitive, but 
sometimes you just have to listen to what they're saying and the eyes tell you everything. It's that connection. And that's the first part of it. And then the other part is reading the, the body language. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's such an important, um, it, such an important piece that is not necessarily taught in healing classes. And but so much of what we're doing is reading body language, and like you said, also sending a certain body language. So if you have a dog that maybe you think challenged too much, you know, just you know, softening up your energy, and whether it's turning to the side, looking down, just kind of. Um, you know, always, always be aware of what your dog is communicating non-verbally and what you're communicating. Um, those are, are, you know, really important things that are, that are hard to, um, to describe, but so mm -hmm. important in what we're Very. doing. I do have a question, Sarah, from, um, from Stephanie, and she wanted to know how you do make a dog feel okay that's stressing in the ring. What are some of the things that you might do? And I'm more specifically, one of the things that I'm thinking is if you have a dog that's stressing in the ring, what are you thinking? And so what are you thinking? Number one, what are you thinking? And then maybe what are your hands doing? What is your body doing? Um, <laughs> um, wow, it's, that's a loaded question because there's a lot there. Um, if I'm walking into the ring and I'm discovering that what is at the end of my leash is a dog that is not handling the situation and, and the stress can happen anytime. My biggest thing for people to say to them is, listen, you go in that ring and you have five people in there. That's approximately 10 minutes in that ring and anything can go wrong in those 10 minutes. In those 10 minutes, a crash outside the ring with crates or buckets and the dog starts pinning the ears and the stress starts. How do you manage it? Each, each dog is gonna handle it differently. Each breed is gonna handle it differently, but the, the first and foremost, if it is my client dog or, or a fellow handler dog, um, the first and foremost, dog comes first. Um, I may wanna win, that win may be important. I'm not gonna ruin the dog's career for it and I'm not gonna crumble the dog for it. So my first step is to assess exactly what's happening. I see the dog panting. I see the tongue curling. I see ears kind of pinning back. I see the glaze start on the eyes. And instantly, everything I'm doing from there on in is soft and it softens. And I will start uh, low gentle pressures behind the back of the ear and all the way down the body. Um, I'll start gentle side kind of almost on the belly but on the side of the dog and just kind of rubbing back and forth nice and slow um often i will massage the ears um uh, part of that is to distract if i think it's sound induced uh so if i'm in there kind of moving the ears quite a bit there's, there's also trigger points in the ears that help that soothing feel um, and i talk to them very quietly good job you know nothing is approached harsh um, and the same thing for the security, say that they're, they're stressing over being examined and, and they're just, they're not taking the situation. I have found key during that examination, especially dogs that are not going to um, take the food, because a lot of dogs will not take it when they're stressing, is to bend forward and look in their eyes. And there's that eye connection again and tell them, you're fine, stay, good job, everything calm. And I have found that to be my most success in getting through to those stressing dogs. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, sometimes you're in situations, like you're saying, you're walking into the ring and you have to make a judgment call. Okay, do I think I can get this dog through this? Or, you know, would it be in the best interest of the dog to just skip this day? Um, and so sometimes we have to make decisions like that where a owner really wants us to get a dog in the ring and for whatever reason, it, it may not be the best long-term solution. So you actually choose to sit, sit that one out. Mm -hmm. And, but I really like how much you, you're listening to the dog and the dog actually has some choice in this. The dog is feeling <laughs> heard. You care how the dog feels. And that's, mm -hmm. um, it's hard. You're, I, I'm being paid for a service and my, they're expecting me to win. 
Um, I'm very open to communicating what exactly I have at the end of the leash, um, what that dog may encounter because of the type of dog I'm dealing with. Um, but above all, each experience in the ring, you know, our seasoned show dogs, our specials, they're in there all the time going through this. Our class dogs, our new dogs, um, and especially during this time where we don't have the shows that we can acclimate them to, we're trying to pull that off in, in two seconds, um, knowing that over the years, walking a dog in that ring that's stressing and trying to force through the situation because that's my job, uh, nine out of 10 times does no good. And it, it ends up being a negative experience all around. Dog first, me, and then the owner because we're not getting where the owner wants us to get. So you kind of have to take a step back from that once in a while and really kind of look at the big picture and what's most important. Yeah, and, and it's just two big, two key things in that are, are trust and safety. And, you know, if your dog knows that they can trust you to keep them safe and to, to make good decisions on their part, um, that's that those are keys to a good, long lasting relationship. Right. Absolutely. I have a, a question from from Elliot, who Elliot got a new standard schnauzer who is thir 13 weeks old. And he would like to know what is the best way to train this puppy that is so easily distracted. Any suggestions? Um, you know, I know it's a little contradicting to some people that are 100% show training, um, but I also own a training center and I'm a big promoter of obedience training. Um, and dogs are smart enough. They can learn to sit, they can learn to stand um, and techniques to help do that. But the first and foremost, I say to 99% of all conversations I have with people is what's more important? Is he more your pet or is he just a show dog? And 99% of the time they're your pets, which means starting off right off the bat is going to be um, learning impulse control, which is often learned in obedience classes. Um, getting into uh, handling classes as depending upon where they are and what ages and so forth. I mean, each, each place has restrictions, but to get them involved in there so that you can work on impulse controlling, especially with breeds like that with the focus um, and the obedience will help with the relationship between dog and owner, which will help build that bond so the focus is turned back more towards them. Um, there's a lot of new classes that are starting um, all over actually since COVID has made it very challenging. A lot of different locations are developing different classes that do train things like impulse control, where if a dog is constantly distracted somewhere else, they're teaching you how to build a better relationship with the dog so that you're more important than the distraction. Um, so I understand the, tr the struggles with the 13 week old puppies right now. Um, there's not a lot available and you do have to drive to do it, but that's the direction I start with them first is always tell them it's your pet first, lifelong pet. So start with some good obedience, build that relationship, take it from there. I love that advice. I remember when I first started showing dogs, people did obedience train their dogs. And now I find that they don't. No. And <laughs> it, it is so frustrating and there are lots of, owners walking their dogs around with pinch collars and that's because they haven't been properly trained in obedience and mm -hmm. like you said obedience is so wonderful to get the dogs to to tune in to pay attention to know that you know you say a command and that they need to pay attention and follow through right. with that so and i and i do believe that i think that that steps in the way Many people are looking for the perfect show dog and they're, they're looking to perfect this, the stand, the exam, the movement, every foot in place. And you can do that and it takes time. You can't just throw the, the lead on the dog and walk in the ring and expect it to be perfect. We do do that once in a while, but it's a challenge. The hardest part uh, as a handler is when the owner presents to me an untrained dog 
and expects me to show it and achieve a positive experience happens a lot more than people realize. Um, owner handlers, though, they have one up on us they can train that dog and they can get that dog to a point where not only are they focused on them, but they're enjoying it because they're not battling that in the ring. And it's something that, you know, when I, I, I don't encourage overtraining per se, but it's something I see all the time. And I explain to people, it's the best direction to start because once you have all that foundation in, you walk in that show ring, you can outdo me, in two seconds flat because you have a well-trained dog that's enjoying it. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, there is nothing like an owner handler team that, I mean, they are so in sync and mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, and it's, uh, again, I like the idea of, of you, you see many dogs that can become like robots and especially junior juniors dogs, which I understand what it's like to be a junior and to just love training your dog because I have so many memories of just stacking my dogs and stacking my dogs and working my dogs. And um, it, it was fun for me. So we did a lot of it, but having other things to train your dogs. So now there's, there's agility. So you can do agility right. with your dog and um, basically, you know, anything you're doing with your dog making it fun and the more you do building that relationship like like you say sarah you know someone that's doing all these other forms of relationship building they're they're really going to have an edge going into the ring mm -hmm. absolutely it leads over to all uh, basically the foundation of, of our world in showing dogs um you know as i said before our seasoned show dogs that are out competing you know they're very well trained. People are so impressed that we have them at the end of a six foot lead with that beautiful free stand and they're just awesome and they never pull and, you know, but we have to remind them it took a while to get there. Um, that is a training process that people who have the dogs living in their home with them, they own them, they can get there. The downside to that, and I carry this over quite a bit over into the junior situation is when I do see them training and training and training. And I think that's wonderful. They're, they're working very hard at achieving a perfected performance. But when you look at the junior or the owner and you look at that dog and you look at their contact, it's all written right there, all over the face, whether they are really connected or not. And it's almost sad sometimes when I see it where I see owners or juniors get really frustrated because they didn't win or the dog wasn't listening. And most of the time I walk up and go, no, you weren't, you weren't listening. Your dog was trying to tell you something was up. You just didn't figure it out. Now outside the ring, we see so much more. And so, you know, inside the ring, they see something different, but it's the same process is, you know, if you're in there training and you're doing it, um, where you're both enjoying it, that your dog is not miserable through it, there's going to be a connection. But if you burn out that connection, that's when you're going to start struggling for those wins as well. So it's like, it's one big picture we keep working on all the time. So when you say burn out that connection, are you referring to overtraining? Um, very similar to it. One of the things that I um, have dealt with, and since I, I do teach handling classes, and so teaching the owners um, the connection with the dog. And also I teach a lot of juniors as well. And so my observation in a lot of situations, and this actually goes over to handlers as, as part of it. We become so robotic in what we're trying to achieve. A dog who has been, say a junior's dog for a couple of years, or you know, the owner is showing them for a lengthy period of time and taking them to handling classes and, and you know, working on that perfection each and every time you get to a point where the dog does become robotic and the spark starts kind of diminishing. And to be honest with you, most of the time it comes back on us because we actually did that to them. We neglected to reward where we needed to reward. We neglected to praise where they needed to be praised. But above all, we, we neglected to kind of reach out to them, touch them and say, good job, bud, and give them the credit because they're working for you. At that point, you've trained them to that level. Let them know that they're doing the right job. 
And unfortunately, and I see this all too much in my career, that the dog becomes the fault for the loss. And that is where the problem is. And I see it too often. The frustration goes from the top of the lead all the way down. And even though the dog gave a pretty decent performance, nothing was really wrong. Without that win, it still became the dog's fault. And that's how you ruin all that previous training that you were doing or all of that drill training and drilling and drilling and drilling. You just dwindle it away when the dog isn't given the rewards that it needs for that. And it becomes, it's sad. I actually love that you bring that up. Um, Cause you know, I have mentioned to, to some of you know that I'm writing a book and it's called Behind the Scenes of Best in Show, Intimate Moments with the Masters. And in several of the handlers that I interviewed, uh, Michelle Scott was one and uh, Janice Hayes was another. And they made mention of having shown and later worked with an animal communicator because they had encountered a problem and they, they had done everything that they knew as a handler and they couldn't figure out how to overcome what had happened. And what was communicated to them, the, the animal communicators that the dog felt disappointed and like it did something wrong when it lost. Mm -hmm. And, you know, anyone that knows Michelle or Janice, they, they felt terrible because they thought, you know, oh, you know, I was never disappointed in my dog. So sometimes what can happen is, you know, handlers, it's, you know, we want to win so bad. And when we walk out of the ring, having lost, sometimes just forgetting to tell your dog, Hey, you know, good job. Like you are awesome because just because we lost and our dogs can feel that our dogs can feel when we're, when we're sad and disappointed. And sometimes, you know, they don't know why. So, um, I, I think that that's something that even many very, very successful pros have lost sight of in those moments is that dogs are always, always sensing the energy that we're putting out Absolutely. and how we're feeling and, and trying you to make sense of it. You can still have a dog misbehave in the ring. You can have them bait diving like crazy. They may have um, uh, lunged at another dog and you had to correct them for that. Um, and they could have just been full of themselves that day. So you may not have had a faultless performance. It may not have even been the best performance your dog can do, but bottom line is you still have to leave saying good job and you need to leave saying a good job before you exit that ring, not just after, because you're associating that positive experience inside that ring. They learn ring gates. We've all learned the ring gate dogs. And so you know, they know, and if they're constantly reminded, even if they didn't give a hundred percent, Hey, good job. Anyway, we got through it. We'll work on it again. Another time it stays on the positive side. You don't burn them out. You don't make them see those ring gates and go oh, this again, because it's a connection and you got to keep that connection. Yeah. And so just, just being in tune to, to what's going on with your dog and, and being mindful that, you know, you're having a certain experience and sometimes we can get, I know I can all caught up in my head, but then remembering that, you know, what's, what's going on for my dog here as well. Um, I want to ask some questions here. Uh, Natalie, do you have a, can you tell me how to move my chat box? Yeah. Sorry. Well, I know some of you have some questions coming in and I want to make sure I can ask them for soon. Oh, here we go. Oh, you got okay. so, so I have a question here. It says, if you're showing someone else's dog and the owner is visible to the dog, whether in the same ring or the next ring or outside, how do you, how do you make them feel better or make them feel safe? Uh, okay, so I'm going to take this as it's happening at the moment. Um, and the reason I say that is because it's, it's the first time I'm showing the dog. And I'm basically assessing because the dog did not stay with me ahead of time. Um, the dog has probably been through a handling class with the owner or 
somebody and um the dog is either brought to my creating setup i'm doing the grooming and blah 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 and then i'm taking it over and so there's not a lot of time to do some bonding that moment um or i'm meeting the owner ringside and taking the dog and you know scooch goo and do all that kind of stuff and walk in and sh try to show the dog i will learn from that initial experience whether i'll ever allow the owner again ringside or in view and i'm not going to ruin the experience on the dog because i'm battling the focus on me because the owner is outside the ring um we've all made the mistake of having an owner meet right outside the ring when we come out with a dog and that starts the dog always looking for the owner every time it shows from there on in so that it really comes down to the dog so if it's happening to me at the moment at the moment i assess what the dog is actually looking at because not all the time it's the owner or it is doing a spatial look just scanning but second of all from there on in i hope I have multiple types of bait in my pocket, including as low reward as maybe a dry biscuit to some dried liver to some pieces of chicken. Um, I have only one or two that I've done filet mignon with, but if it's needed, fine. Um, but at that point, my goal is to work on that connection and I've got a whopping two minutes of time to get it and get the focus on me. And so I will actually start um, attention to name is what we call it in training, but I will start the eye contact following the food up to my nose and trying to get the dog to look at me and not look everywhere else on what's happening. Um, penning the experience and how that dog got through it. I come out of that ring and I assess the situation on whether it's something that we can work with and get it better or whether we have to rearrange how we do this whether the owner can actually be ringside or not and so that's how i would handle it okay thank you well you being a junior judge i do want to um see if we can ask some questions yeah. regarding that as well what are you what are you looking for when a junior, when a class first walks in? What are some of the things you'll be paying attention to? Uh, well, the hardest thing is um, I don't really like to stand outside the ring um, any longer than I have to before I go in to judge. Our goal when we go in that ring is anything that we've learned outside the ring gets left outside the ring. And we are going to judge at that moment inside the ring. Um, what I'm looking for when, when the juniors come in the ring, um, is I want to see them actually be handlers. I want to see what that's the purpose for me as a junior judge. It's all about their handling. And so I want to see them walk in as they are going to show a dog going all the way to best junior. And that's the attitude I wanna see coming in. I wanna see confidence coming in. I wanna see them paying attention to instruction as they are given. And if it isn't clear to them, ask and not feel like that's a penalty for asking. Um, and I wanna see them communicating as well with the other juniors as, as we call it sportsmanship and making sure that everybody's got the space they need and so forth. So the first thing, like I said, is walking in with that confidence that regardless of the performance from the dog, they are going to walk out with Best Junior because they know how to handle a dog. That's what I look for. Thank you. Do you ever have, have you had yourself coming down to decide between two people? Do you ever have there being like a deciding factor that when you just can't make up your mind between two, is there something you'll, you'll always go to in that situation? There's actually probably quite a few, but the first and foremost would be, um, I am not accepting to heavy handing, heavy handling of a dog inside the ring. Um, if I've ever seen somebody um, frustrated with a dog, hit the dog or anything like that, it's a done deal in my head. But I've watched um, 
out of the corner of my eye while I'm paying attention. If I have somebody in mind, I will kind of side angle glance a few times and I'm not looking for them to be standing there with the perfect erect dog, not with a foot out of place. I'm actually watching how they're focusing on the situation. Are they paying attention to what the other juniors are doing? Are they paying attention to where the dogs are being stacked in front? Are they um, paying attention to their dog and working their dog as well, but that they're not doing that robotic stand the whole time, take three steps forward, stand again, three steps forward, that they're kind of doing what they're supposed to do. They're gonna come in and handle the dog, present the dog as um, it should be presented so that the overall picture is a nice and pleasing picture to look at while they're handling through the situation. So there's a few times that I would sit there and look at the lineup and watch the behaviors of the juniors that were working through it. And I have to tell you, most juniors, when they're hitting the higher classes, they give you almost faultless performances. They're, there's, we're not technically supposed to change up patterns and things like that on them. Um, but you're honestly breaking it down to who's got the connection, who's doing the handling. And that's where my mind takes me towards the end as I'm making those decisions. And so explain, can you explain connection? What are you seeing it, when you're seeing a good connection? Um, I've seen the, um, I've done this and I'm bored and I'm doing everything they're asking connection. So generally at that point, you know, it's the house pet um, probably goes to every handling class and there's no, the eye connection is just not there. There's no sparkle. Um, dog did everything it's asked. Junior does everything it's asked, but the pizzazz is missing. And that's that root of that connection because they're forgetting the timing of the reward. And the worst thing is juniors that will hear, oh, if you, the, the person is looking for a good relationship with the dog, you watch them petting their dogs and you know, it's not real. There's, there's, <laughs> That dog. <laughs> and I know you know what I'm talking about. Um, there's an honest connection and that's what ends up missing when the intensity for those juniors, when it's counting towards Westminster or just it's getting down to the wire and it burns out and then they start not doing as well. So it's, I hate to say it, it, stand, it shows, it definitely shows. I love what you're saying because it actually brings to mind a new favorite word of mine and, and that being authenticity. And it's, it's one of the reasons why, you know, many of us loves do love dogs because mm -hmm. they're very authentic and mm -hmm. their emotions and where they're at. And you being a true and true dog person, you can spot authenticity. And oh, when yeah. someone is, you know, putting yeah. on a show and really is embodying mm -hmm. what it is that you want to yeah it's clearly it when it's done excessively in intent and you know that the look is looking up to make sure you're looking you know there's no authenticity to it but when i watch a handler trying and and the dog is happy and the tail is going back and forth a million miles an hour and there's there's not a ton of perfection but they're working it and working it that's handling that is a connection and it's good to see. And whether the dog is their family pet dog or whether it's a substitute, I don't know. But um, you can't help but smile because you know their energy is there to, to do well. And they may be new at learning or they're working up the ladder or it's a new dog or training or whatever the case. But you know, when you see that intermittent affection of petting or the smile, there's actually when you're, even though we're intense to win and we often forget to smile when we're showing, that's, you know, I'm queen of that. Um, there's a, a time of that authenticity where you watch them and they do something with the dog and they give the dog a little bit of a smile. You know, that's, it's as the connection's still there. It's just calm. You know, they're keeping it under wraps. They're keeping it professional, 
because they're in there to try to win. Is there a common mistake that you see in junior handling? Um, I see some things that, that should probably go away, but this is my personal opinion. Um, it would probably be interesting if you ever get to a point where you could have a mass group of, of uh, junior judges and have us all voice our opinion on some of it, but you see things in trend. Um, and you watch certain classic behaviors where um, as some of the younger juniors might see a older junior do well and it's a certain body movement and an arm swing and, and so forth, when actually a lot of it is balance <laughs> and done by our speed if we're running, but they're picking it up as it's the thing to do. Um, and it doesn't look natural. There's nothing natural about it. And then the other things that I have seen is the table testing. Um, a junior will walk up with a, a, a table dog after the table has been brought out and tested by the ring store and the judge. Um, and I'll watch a junior walk up to that table and table test it with their hand first as if it's going to wiggle. Um, technically speaking, the judge has already done that and so is the ring store. So it's almost as an insult. Um, but on another handling style, if you are outside and putting your hand on it to make sure the table's not hot, that's key, that's handling. So it's perceived differently from different people. Um, you know, other than that, often I'll say to somebody, if you feel you're not, or a junior in particular, if you feel like you're, you're getting stuck at third and fourth or not even in a placement, evaluate yourself, videotape yourself, have someone videotape you and see what's happening. Are you doing silly things that just aren't letting you stand out? Are you becoming too common with everybody else? Because it's just, you know, common mistakes or, um, you know, where you think that the other person did that, you're supposed to do that, but you have a totally different dog. So it really comes down to a lot of little things that crop up in that where you start to see these, they become habits that aren't, aren't the best habits to have. I think that videotaping is super helpful, especially, you know, during COVID, I know that there are a lot of uh, juniors that can't get to handling class, don't have as many shows and, you know, having someone record you and then you really analyzing um, if, if, it looks the way you think it feels. I can do this as well. I've had dogs where for whatever reason, it may feel great. And I'll say, can you do a video or can you take some pictures? And then it actually doesn't look as good as it felt mm -hmm. to me. And that can be really, really helpful. So I like what yep. you're saying, Sarah, if something isn't it's working um, or you're trying to learn mm -hmm. videos, pictures. A lot of it is if you're, if you're watching exactly what you're doing each and every time in there. Um, your timing could be off for whatever reason. Um, something's happening where there's no fluid motion and it's, and it's not a pretty sight to see. You know, handling, we're just trying to, our goal is to make sure the dog looks good, but there's a lot more to that. And as a handler, we work on our timing with our body positioning with the dog. Where, where are we? Are we towards the front of the dog, the middle of the dog, the back of the dog? You know, all sorts of things. A junior goes in there with their particular dog and they have to work that as well. Um, and the same thing that when I start the videotaping and I will say to someone here, I want you to do video and I'll have them watch the whole thing. And all of a sudden they'll start to realize certain things that they're doing that really distracts on the overall picture. And it has turned into a great tool, great tool. Yeah, I think it's really helpful. I mean, we all, I mean, I know myself, I, you know, I, I always want to improve and learn, but when somebody's telling me what I need to do, it's, it's, it can be a little hard to receive those words and it can be a little more helpful to, to be able to see it. And, and mm -hmm. um, I have that happen. My, you know, my daughter's 12 and there's certain things she does in the basketball court. And I know she doesn't like hearing it. I don't like hearing things critical as much as I try to sound nice about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're continuing to have certain challenges, 
and we have somebody record it. So rather than taking somebody else's word for it, you can take a look at yourself and, and make that decision and see. Absolutely. If Um, any other? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna look in this chat box here for some more questions. Okay, I have a question from Debbie. Oh, it's actually said. Oh, that's to everyone. So I'm gonna. I will do that. Okay, so this is from, oh, from, from Caitlin. What would you recommend doing with your dog when he freaks out that there is a big scary dog? Um, what would you do to make them feel better? If the dog was freaking out because there's a big scary dog, um, first of all, assess how you can change positionings to get your dog that is currently freaking out um, to be able to assess the situation that they're safe. So one of the primary, um, you run into this more often in group rings and or possibly junior rings where you, you go in at the wrong time and you get clustered in with some dogs that act up. Um, in juniors, you have to go in by armband and then you're told to assess yourself in speed and move around. So in, in summary of dealing with that, some dogs are hypersensitive. Say for instance, biggest for instance, is you have a bulldog right behind you, just breathing. And in front of the bulldog is a pointer who is hearing this bulldog breathe and is assuming it's being growled at and it's struggling with this. The, the problem with that is that the dog needs to turn and actually face what's doing and realize it's not a threat. If I have a situation where it's more equal size and I have a dog that's even overzealous, that it's not really a threat, but my dog isn't really liking that, I'm going to try to get behind that situation so that my dog can look forward and my dog can see that that dog is not the threat. Um, and so that's how I would have to assess it. And sometimes you're put into a situation that you can't fix that one time, but something like the junior ring or something like the group ring, um, lesson learned the first time, I'll make sure I'm not in front of that dog again, because I know in the junior ring, if I know that my dog is having a problem with another dog in there, I will do the same thing. I'll do my best to make sure that that dog's in front versus behind me so my dog is not worried about that dog. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So we're getting to the point that uh, we're gonna need to wrap up here. So I do, again, wanna thank Sarah for her time and let all of you know that when, um, that I am going to unmute people's microphones for those that would actually like to be able to ask Sarah direct questions to be able to, you know, maybe show your face and you can meet Sarah, talk with her one-on-one. -on -one. I'll have an opportunity for that in just a minute. Um, I do wanna let all of you know that I do have a free YouTube channel that is Win All Coaching LLC. And on the YouTube channel, it has these webinars clips from these webinars with different suggestions from Tooney and Katie and Esteban. So if anyone is interested in checking that out, it's Win All Coaching LLC, and that will have lots of little tips, and I hope you like it. That came from um, one of the participants actually recommended and asked, requested that I do this, so, so I did it. So I hope you guys like it, and I really love getting feedback from you. So thank you all for participating. Thank you, Sarah, for your time. We're going to wrap up the recording, but I am going to unmute and um, allow those of you who would like to ask questions to either myself or Sarah to do so. Okay.